earth, air, fire, water, the four elements that make our world. Water began as ancient glacial ice, as newly formed droplets, as creeks, ponds, lakes, and rivers. Over a million years ago, huge glaciers moved southward through Wisconsin, carving a valley, gouging the Fox River. River time, it has its own separate measure. There are no real clocks to mark its passage, no hour by which to define its face. From a distant era of time comes the story. The Fox River traces this land as it breaks out of trees, runs through the hills and valleys, buries itself in rock. It has been here longer than any of us, holding a song up to the wind, a song of waterfalls and rapids, of a current swift and wild. River time. To know its beginnings is to know ourselves. The river story is our story. Listen to its heartbeat. Hear the words it speaks. It's a life river, nourishing us all, natives and voyagers alike. It is our river. Come, listen to our story. The river was a gathering place for animals and birds and people. The Winnebago, Fox, Oneida, Menominee. The tribes lived in the valley by the river long before the coming of the first white man. Tribes who honored the souls of the great river. They traveled and memorized it, built their dwellings and buried their dead next to it. Drew a livelihood from it, celebrated and consecrated it, and they named it Okasidiming, the highway. They loved the way the river held the reflection of the eagle, how its rhythm pulsed in their hearts, how it raced the sun toward morning, how the river shivered in the night. They also feared the river because of the rapids that stretched across the water. The French called one waterfall Le Grand Chute because of the great plunge of the rapids. If we were eagle, fish, or animal, we would have a better understanding of river time. We could look out on the world of the sun. We could look back down a corridor of time to those moments when the river was young when early explorers saw it as a possible passageway to the Orient. Fur traders saw it as a route to riches, and the Jesuit missionaries used it as a road to Christianity. Jean Nicolet, a French explorer looking for a passage to India and China, was the first white man to step foot on the banks of the Fox. The year, 1634. Other explorers and missionaries followed. Pierre Esprit Radisson, Nicola Perrault, Claude Jean Alloway, Louis Joliet, Jacques Marquette. Their names are written forever in the Song of the River. The first white settlers along the river were fur traders, Dominic Ducharme, and brothers Augustine and Hippolyte Grignot. Augustine built near the Kakana stretch of the river. Hippolyte went further up the river 
and in 1835 built his home near the rapids where travelers had to portage, near an early Indian village. He opened his home to those who needed a night's lodging, and it became known as the White Heron Inn. On September 3, 1836, the Menominee Indians released four million acres of land to the United States government. Governor Henry Dodge came by boat to the council on the west bank of the river. Chief Oshkosh was in command. For six days they met. Finally, they signed the Treaty of the Cedars. The land was purchased for $700,000, about 17 cents an acre. Within five months, the Menominees had moved west, and this new, vast land was for sale. Amos Lawrence, a wealthy Easterner, found himself the unwilling possessor of over 5,000 acres of that land in the Fox River Valley. And he wrote to his agent, a Mr. Eastman of Green Bay. I have been thinking of the establishment of an institution of learning or college on the Williams land. And there seems to be a good opportunity, not only for improving the tone of morals and the standard of education in that vicinity, but also of conferring a lasting benefit on a portion of our countrymen who most need it. Chartered in 1847, Lawrence University of Wisconsin, as it was first named, incorporated a revolutionary idea. It was only the second college in the United States to do so. Men were allowed, of course, to attend classes. And women were too. John Johnston and his family helped clear the land for Lawrence, and soon the Johnston home became the center of the new city. A visitor remembered, the Johnston shanty had a roof over only part of the structure, which was used for sleeping. But despite this fact, the Johnston shack immediately became an inn for the new settlers who arrived in the district. My father and mother stayed there on their arrival, and the next morning it had been planned to have griddle cakes for breakfast, and it was raining quite hard. My father held an umbrella over Mrs. Johnston's head while she baked the cakes. The Johnston home became the first hotel, hospital, post office, church, and Sabbath room. Soon, William Smith Warner came to town, purchased the first four lots ever sold, and as the overseer of roads, cleared the timber to build the first major street, College Avenue. By 1851, just three years after Wisconsin became a state, 300 people called the Little Valley their home. The area now included three villages, Appleton, named after Samuel and Sarah Appleton, relatives of Amos Lawrence, Lawsburg, after George Law, who owned most of the land, and the village of Grand Chute, named after the great waterfall on the river. Lawrence believed in the limitless opportunities of the Fox Valley, and he was right. Soon sawmills were built, an ice company, wagon and blacksmith shops, cabinet and chair factories, lumber and flour mills, the beginnings of industrial Appleton. George Richmond and his two brothers built the first paper mill in 1853. It was described as a risky, daredevil operation, but it was successful. Within a year, 14 industries depended on the river as a source of power. So many mills, factories, houses, and stores were being built that lumber and sawmills were busy from early morning to late evening. A visitor took notice. The only reason people do not make a summer resort of Appleton is on account of the numerous and flourishing industries already located there. If one could close their eyes to the mills and factories and machine shops and close their ears to the whir and rattle of wheels and enginery, there would remain one of the most charming cities in the United States. Colonel Samuel Ryan helped his four boys publish the city's first newspaper in 1853. They named it the Crescent for the bend in the river. In the early 1850s, the villages along the river made plans to deepen 
and widen the channels so boats could bypass the rapids without danger. It would take several years to raise the money. It would take even more lives to complete it. Irish and German work gangs supplied the manual labor. In June of 1856, people gathered along the banks to celebrate the opening of the Fox River locks and canals. The first boat to come through the canal started in Pittsburgh. Then, at the village of Portage, the side wheeler Aquila went through the canal to the upper Fox, into Lake Winnebago, and finally into the lower Fox River. Word spread quickly of her arrival. The bands played, hundreds cheered when they saw her. A year later, the Aquila sank in Lake Winnebago during a violent storm, but her name would become a part of river time. In the springtime of 1857, the villages of Lawsburg, Grand Chute, and Appleton incorporate into one city. They decide on Appleton as the official name. The population has grown to 2,000. As many as 24 steamers a week call on the busy little port. The Lawrence Institute graduates their first class of seniors. Unfortunately, the diplomas ordered from the east do not arrive. They sink with the ill-fated Aquila to the bottom of Lake Winnebago. The other city thoroughfare College Avenue was a dusty, rutted roadway. So the ladies of the city formed a sewing society to raise money for the first board sidewalks. Drivers who came too close to the sidewalk with their wagons were in danger of being fined. Laws were stiff. If pigs were caught running loose in the village, their owners were fined 75 cents. Business was booming in the early 1860s. Appleton was building homes, factories, roads, bridges, and sidewalks. The valley had become a major milling center. Flour and lumber industries flourished side by side on the banks of the Fox. Soon, many more paper and pulp mills planted roots deep along the Fox River. Other companies followed. And when the flour industry moved westward, those mills were easily converted to pulp and paper. The future of the industry was shaped, and the expansion of the railroads brought even more prosperity to the growing industry. But the coming of the railroads meant bankruptcy for the canal system, and by 1872, the U.S. Corps of Engineers had taken over. Soon, they would decide to improve the canal system, dredge it, widen it, make it a highway once again. Soon, surveyors were mapping improvements. Huge limestone blocks were transported from the High Cliff Quarry to replace the original stone. The ironwork for the valves, gates, and turntables was worked in the local foundries. It was another economic boost for the valley. Mr. A. B. Kelly recounted his trip. Monday, we took the steamer Brooklyn for Green Bay. We soon crossed the lake and entered the Lower Fox River. It was almost wonder world with some of the best facilities for manufacturing enterprises in the world. The water power at Appleton and Kakana is pronounced by Eastern experts superior. Its facilities for transporting its finished products by water to the markets of the world will make this the great manufacturing center of the Northwest. Appleton became a city of firsts. C.J. Pettibone opened the first chain store on College Avenue. A banker, Mr. Alfred Galpin, Jr., purchased a pair of telephones and wired them between his home and the bank. Then to the drugstore and two physicians' homes. It was the first exchange in Wisconsin and one of the first in the nation. Then the announcement came that Thomas Edison had found a way to put the mysterious power of electricity to practical use. Appleton financier and industrialist H.J. Rogers purchased the Edison rights for the Fox Valley. By August of 1882, a hydroelectric plant was built and equipment installed. Rogers gambled his faith and his fortune on the belief that the great power of the fox could be harnessed to light the Edison lamps. 
It was an untried venture, bold and successful. The Rogers home became the first in the West to be exclusively lighted by electric lamps. And within three months, the first hydroelectric central station in the world began sending electricity. The pioneer days were over. Soon, Appleton would become the home of the first commercially successful electric streetcar, an event which amused the Crescent newspaper editor. On Friday afternoon of last week, the experiment of running streetcars by electricity was tried on College Avenue and resulted in pronounced success to the astonishment of friends of the enterprise as well as the many doubting wiseacres who had practiced on a broad guffaw to explode in case of failure. And so it was that the trolley line started officially on August 16, 1886, full of passengers, each paying a fare of five cents. Appleton and the valley were moving, on land and on the water. It truly was river time. As the valley prospered, people began to look to the river and lakes for recreation. Excursion boats were the most popular with bands and ice cream and gaily dressed passengers and laughter. Fleets of spectators formed regattas. Yachting came of age. Sailing became the summer sport. Appleton formed its own boat club, and golf enthusiasts built their own country club with the view of the river, of course. And a young woman, Margaret Winslow, picked up her new camera, developed her pictures into blueprints, and began keeping a diary. September 13th, 1898. The golf club has been in existence for about a month and so the links are not very good yet. They are just across the river west of Lake Street. July 7th, 1901. They have regular suppers up at the golf club now, every Wednesday and Saturday nights. Mother thought it would be a good chance for me to get acquainted with the town people, so I joined the club again. They dance after the supper, and I always have a good time. The suppers seem a sort of family gathering, and it is that sort of thing I have missed so much when I was away at school in the East. The city continued to prosper. Stately homes and successful businesses shared the river's edge. Reuben Thwaites, a historian, strolled through the city and commented, It is a beautiful city, the gem of the Lower Fox. The wealthy dwellers court the summits of the riverbanks, where the valley view is panoramic. There is much wealth among the manufacturers who rule the city, and prosperity attends their reign. The real heroine of this tale is the beautiful town of Appleton. Helen Miles Rogers Reed grew up in Appleton and became the editor of the New York Herald Tribune. She wrote of her home adjoining Lawrence College, the hill down to the river made exciting coasting in the winter, and in the summer, when the grass was dry, we slid down it with the same success. Appleton was famous for various assets beside the college. It had the first electric lights in a hotel that had been built by my progressive father, who was greatly loved in the community. It also had the first electric streetcar, a fact confirmed by none other than Thomas Edison when I sat next to him at the home of George Eastman in Rochester, New York, when we were celebrating his first colored photographs. Even though I lived in various other communities, I never loved any place the way I did Appleton. At the turn of the century, Appleton seemed to have everything. There was the new armory next to the Presbyterian Church, the Young Men's Christian Association, the Opera House, the Children's Home, the County Asylum, St. Elizabeth Hospital, the Music Conservatory, uh, 
gas buggies as well as horses shared the roads, and there were new sidewalks outside of Pettibones. The river was also a busy thoroughfare. Day and night, the barges hauled coal, wood, gravel, and other cargo, feeding a paper industry in a region bursting at the seams with the greatest concentration of paper mills on any river anywhere. Many rivers were larger and mightier, but none was more valuable than the fox. But the river had changed. 100 years after they signed the Treaty of the Cedars, Peter Lamott of the Menominee tribe told their river story. That Nemeth Kekiketian Okekies Nepeku through me the dead chiefs speak. They who sold this land to my white brothers a hundred years ago. For us the river was a path. It was a fine, pure path winding through the woods. There were great pines along our path, balsam, hemlock, and spruce, and the shadow of these trees fell across our path as we paddled in the river. We knew all its turnings, all its sandbars and waterfalls, the places where the beaver were plentiful, and the places where the deer came down to drink. This was our path, and whenever we wished to drink of it, we could do so, for the water was pure, and there was no evil anywhere. My white brother bought our path in all the woods beginning 110 years ago, for they saw in our path not a river, but a power to be harnessed for work. Our tribe used the river when we traveled. Your tribe used the river for power. For you need not to travel. You have arrived. This is the end of the road. The river was tame. The sulfur springs of Tallulah Park, once the toast of the town, were covered by factories. Soon the excursion boat stopped then the barges. And what remained were the results, the totals and balances, the fruits of a century of business venturing, of bankruptcies, panics, depressions, booms, and wars, the totals of inventions and development. What remained was a river for discarding, dumping, disposing. River time was running out. Almost 100 years after the first paper mills began using the river, those same mills were called upon to stop abusing the river. Federal agencies, local industries, concerned citizens finally took action to try and save the river and perhaps themselves as well. The paper industry spent millions of dollars to begin cleaning the river. The city improved its water treatment plants. Citizens restored old homes, and abandoned factories became new homes. New bridges spanned the river. Slowly, the fish returned, and so did the laughter. It is clear our new journey has just begun. Standing here close to the river, you can almost feel those who came before. So too, on a summer evening, hundreds of years ago, someone must have stood here resting for a moment. And in that moment, there was no time, no difference between who stood here then and who stands here now. There is the same need for food and shelter the same need to communicate, to put down symbols for others to see. The same response to water and what it means to the very base of our being. So go ahead. Finger the tangled roots and moss. Discover that by moving a hand just under the water, you can evoke all kinds of kaleidoscopic patterns. Patterns of our history, of our time. 
push against the fabric of the river. Feel it then, feel it now. Feel a part of river time. 